introduction. Welcome all. And uh, those of you who weren't with us this morning, just to say uh, welcome to our session or evidence hearing session, uh, which is mostly around uh, uh, health and well-being, an extremely important uh, area, an area that has challenged London for many, many years. Uh, and the inequalities in both health and health care still remain a significant challenge. And uh, so we have a, a wonderful set of witnesses, which we will see in a minute. The areas that we will be, uh, the, the purpose of this afternoon session is to address some very important questions, which are the policy levers that we can improve, use to improve health. Uh, and if I could remind you that uh, this is very much within the gift of Boris, because he has some uh, executive uh, he's accountable for the delivery of health and uh, well-being within the capital. We're looking at technology. We're asking our witnesses on the role of technology in helping improving health. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, trying also to address some of the urban determinants of health, uh, the urban design, other issues, education, housing, uh, and let's not forget the the most important issue, which is mental health and mental well-being, which is very much part of this theme as well. So on that note, if I could introduce you our, uh, our uh, wonderful uh, panel members who are with me, uh, starting off with uh, Kaz, who's on the right-hand side, who is a... a uh, GP, but also a friend and a colleague who I've known for many, many years, who has a huge interest in uh, in uh, in de delivering, improving the delivery of primary care. Yvonne, on my right hand side, Yvonne Doyle, who is the uh, Dr. Yvonne Doyle, Regional Director of Public Health, and uh, on my left hand side we have Tim Spicer, who is uh, also a GP and a colleague who I've known for many, many years, and uh, we have Crystal Oldman also sitting on my left-hand side. Now, I'm not going to go through their massive biographies because they're very, very big, but do visit the website. They've done huge contributions in London. I'm very grateful for your time and for being here. And uh, we're going to start off with our first uh, set of witnesses, uh, Mr. Henry Dimbleby and Mr. Gareth Jones. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome to uh, uh, welcome to this. And uh, what a wonderful session to start off with. I was a commie chef as well at some stage. Were you? Yeah. Uh, and uh, you never work harder in your life after that. Absolutely right. Yeah, and uh, very similar comparison to the operating theatre, working in a kitchen. So uh, a slightly less jeopardy. That's right. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you, and uh, Gareth. Thank also. Thanks for being here. Thanks uh, for the opportunity. No, you've uh, you know uh, I left mine at home. Uh, today. So, uh, that's <laughs> so uh, please give us your own thoughts and views about uh, technology and innovation and in really driving the consumer into health and well-being. Can we kick off? Um, it's obviously a subject very close to our heart. Just to give those who aren't familiar with a little bit of my uh, background in my company. My company is involved in producing products that measure your movement and then uh, relate that via online systems, either to your mobile phone or to your desktop, and capture that information and therefore give you valuable stuff that you didn't have before. I'm really toning down the sale because I know this is not a sales environment. Um, we found in the last two years um, that since we've entered the UK market, uh, we've sold uh, a couple of hundred thousand devices. Excuse me if I can't be exact because my company's a private company and we don't reveal that. Um, but about halfway through last year, uh, I was, uh, had the pleasure of being involved with a, a, a fund, uh, an organization called UK Active. And UK Active were a group of leisure companies, fitness people, and the majority of the conversation used to center around the digital legacy. And it seemed to me that it was like a almost like a head-banging session where last year in 2012, or the year before, we were saying about how much was going on in the country, how it was going to stimulate the country into movement, and how we were going to progress from there to become a healthier nation, and that would have a long-term effect. And 
that patently wasn't happening. So what Fitbit did to actually get a little bit more substance behind what we were trying to profess through our products was that we undertook a study in the UK, um, and the study was called um, the uh, Fitbit Healthy Futures Report. And that gave valuable insight in a way that wasn't previously being covered into people's attitudes towards the uh, issues I think we're certainly here to discuss or to participate in today. Um, and, for example, there was things like 60% um, of the people in the survey claimed awareness and understanding of the issues, but only 10% agree that it has led to a strong positive impact on their behaviour. 20% uh, admit to being totally baffled by the range of messages, not technological messages, but messages coming out about what they should be doing to be healthier, to be slimmer, to be fitter. 38% agreed that the language used in such messaging stigmatized individuals. Mm -hmm. And finally, 28% report strong positive impacts on their behavior once they get into some form of self-measurement. And that could be making just simple notes themselves. It doesn't have to be one of my wonderful products, so I'm not here banging the drum on that, but I'm simply saying that coming out of this study was really strong messages that said people were reacting adversely to the way they felt they were being lectured, the way the information was being presented to them. Okay. And then that comes around to why I think that our products and products like mine are having more success because what we clearly identified in the study was a whole body of people which we call Generation Me. And Generation Me are people like all of us in this room who digest information in the 21st century, the second decade, and we digest that information in a format that we are extremely comfortable with and it's very personalized. And we may do it through our mobile phones, we may do it through our laptops, we may do it through the printed word, we may do it on a number of different levels. But each of us in this current era has the ability to have information given to us in a fashion acceptable to us and in line with our lifestyle. Right. And consequently, I think products like ours are beginning to succeed and gain traction because it delivers information pertinent personal information in a way that people are comfortable with. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gareth. So Henry, actually, I'm, you've done so much um, in this area. Despite, well, despite having a physics degree, I'm not a technologist. I'm actually going to talk a bit about schools. Yeah. Uh, me and my business partner, John Vincent, yeah. uh, just completed the school food plan. Uh, the plan itself was actually uh, aimed on doing three things. There were three outcomes. One was achievement and the role of food and improving or reducing inequalities in achievement. The second was pleasure, so actually just allowing people to enjoy the pleasure of cooking and enjoying food through their lives. But the third was health. And um, when we came to it, about 10 years ago probably, um, food in schools was viewed by some educationists as quite a wishy-washy excuse for not learning maths and English. But actually we were quite lucky. By the time we came, the, you know, the £6 billion pounds being spent on food-related disease by the, by the NHS... Um, people were beginning to wake up. And so we, people were asking, what can schools do to stop this increase in obesity? 20%, of, as you all know, 20% of children leaving primary school yep. uh, are now obese. And there were three, there were three things in the plan that we, where we thought schools uh, could help. The first was on uh, learning cooking. And um, as a result of the work we did, cooking is now going to be from September compulsory in the curriculum for all children up to the age of 14. And the wording we were particularly pleased by. So the wording, rather than being technocratic, part of design and technology, it talks about um, uh, every child being able to um, cook a repertoire of predominantly savoury dishes so they're able to feed themselves and others a healthy diet, a healthy and tasty diet. Um, now, the evidence for that is interesting. So one of the things about, and I'll come on to this in a second, one of the things about looking at what you can do in schools is it's such a complex system, and I'm sure you'll find this in other areas, that the evidence, it's hard to link one thing to another thing. There is evidence for, there was a 1992 study in the States that showed that poorer uh, women who cooked uh, had better health outcomes than richer women who didn't cook. There was a similar study in Korea that showed that. 
but it's hard to find direct evidence on teaching, cooking, and, and health. And I would recommend that, uh, that there is some emerging evidence on this, and I'd recommend you speak to Dr. Michael Nelson, uh, who's been doing work in, uh, in UK schools that looks at, actually, there is now uh, evidence that increasing the, the, uh, improving the food culture in school can improve the health of the children. So the first thing was the curriculum. Um, the second thing uh, that we looked at was um, the food they eat. So, uh, again, the evidence here is that uh, used to be, it's very hard, the children eat so many things other than the food at school. You know, they can eat a fantastic lunch at school and then nip down the chip shop and have an energy drink and a donut and a, a thing of crisps and all the, you know, and they only eat at school 200 days a year. But actually, it does seem there is, again, and Michael Nelson has it, there is um, uh, increasing evidence that actually improving the food that children eat in their school can improve their health outcomes. And when we were looking at this, we were looking at, uh, the third thing we did was we looked at, we said, well, okay, it's very hard to unpick. There are so many things going on in these children's lives, particularly in London. Um, the, the children in one school, you know, my son's school uh, is a primary school in Hackney, and it's um, used to be about 45% free school meals. It's now 35% free school meals, and probably about 35% uh, very rich, middle class people like me. So to look at a school and try and unpick what's going on is very difficult. But if you look at um, global uh, initiatives, uh, what we began to think is, you look at things like what happened, what Pe Pe Pekka Puska did in, in Finland, where they actually moved the dial a lot. And we saw people in the UK celebrating 1% reduce in, in reduction in, in obesity. You know, these small, very statistically significant move, um, moves. Uh, but we thought, well, you, know, you look at some of these holistic mm. programs, they change. Um, in, in Finland, they increase male life expectancy expected by seven years. Uh, so that was why the, the flagship boroughs in London became an idea, which was we're taking with boroughs um, two boroughs um, and trying to change the health outcomes, uh, working with the supermarkets to reconfigure the aisles, working with the schools, working on the high street, to see if over a period of five years we can actually in a very small controllable area create an energy around improving the food that will deliver, that will prove that you can Correct. do, um, that you can actually make a bigger difference than those small statistical differences. Which brings me on to my last point, which is, uh, which you will know, but I think it's worth repeating. As someone who uh, isn't a, a medic by training, I was amazed by the number of people who said again and again, doctors, health experts, who said the same thing, which was... Uh, you know, the NHS spends, you'll be able to tell me the figures, but 95% of its budget uh, on cure and 5% on uh, other things. Of that 5%, 2.5% is research, 2.5% is prevention. And almost unanimously, everyone said to me, uh, if you could move just 1% of that 95% and put it to prevention, you could have a massive impact and then you go and talk to the, uh, to the Department of Health, and they say, but to do that, you need to tell those 1% of people they're not going to get their drugs. And that is politically uh, impossible. So I don't know what the answer to that was, but I was, we, John and I, were both um, amazed by how regularly that problem was brought up by, as, as amateurs in the area, by professionals that we met. Thank you very much for that. And, uh, and I'm just going to open it up for questions from our, not all of us will ask you mm -hmm. questions, but few of us would, and uh, any, any questions? Guys, would you like to? Yep. Can I kick off, and um, this question really to Gareth, and I thought your um, presentation was very, was, was memorable in, in actually talking about how patients hate being lectured at, because that's exactly my experience for most patients. I just wondered, though, how you might take some of what you were talking about and use that um, to address the problems for particularly vulnerable groups. So we know that um, the elderly patients and patients with mental health problems would benefit from um, increasing the amount of exercise, but they're very difficult um, to support to do that. And the other group that um, we recognise as being particularly difficult are teenage girls who find it very difficult to um, uh, both join in and find... Um, sports to do, and I just wonder what your solutions to those particular groups might be. Thanks. Um, 
the direct opportunity to um, sort of be successful in those groups comes back to uh, understanding that these people don't want to be labelled through having to sort of wear a tracker or exhibit a tracker. It, that then compromises their identity. It makes them certainly with the uh, um, the, the young uh, the younger sort of teenage girls. So what we found as a producer of products is that we make two different types. We make a product that you can wear on your wrist, and we make a, a second product which you can wear on your body, or and that can be anywhere secreted on your body. You can wear it in a pocket. You can wear it. Um, it doesn't have to be exhibited. It doesn't have to be uh, visible. Um, but the the most important thing about um, helping groups like this is that their biggest difficulty comes in actually making a decision. And the smaller you make that decision, the 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 the, the least life changing you make that decision on an either an income or on a personal habits basis the better is the chance you will succeed. And if you say to people that we are going to help you improve your health significantly by doing more of what you just do every single day in life, hopefully, which is movement, walking, taking the stairs instead of an escalator or a lift, actually making the decision easy to make. Again, part of the study that we undertook showed that in areas that were deprived or in financial pressure, people are consumed with what they see as greater issues on a day-to-day -day basis with respect to simple survival. And hence, they look at these things and say, I'm not going to make a life-changing decision to go to the gym or to um, start uh, running um, five days a week because I have family, I have a job to do, a job I'm trying to keep, I've got a second job I'm trying to uh, um, keep as well to bring income in, or I have other difficulties, like in my environment there might not be those facilities. So what we've done is we've boiled it down to simple, small decisions. And we then show people that by making these simple, small changes and then keeping that up habitually, they can then have significant results. If you try to move somebody tomorrow from a position of being very sedentary for whatever reason to being uh, halfway through to being some sort of triathlete, then you know it's not going to happen. And in an environment where m emotionally there's that sort of backed up with decisions that are more, so we say, in their faces, then again, these health decisions are going to get put to the back. They, it's what we call um, discounting or future discounting. They'll say, I'll do that later. I'll do that later. I'll get fit later. In the meantime, I've got to go out and get a job. I've got to feed the kids. I've got to do whatever. But, you, you know, if we wait for that to happen, then we will be looking at the car crash in our faces. So the thing you've got to focus on is talking to people at the level where they can say, I make a small change, and I will get positive reassertions through things like the community that are also trying to achieve that. Social messaging makes a big part of that. And consequently, if people begin to walk, say, 1,000 steps in a day, whereas before they were doing 500, if all of a sudden they get some form of reaffirmation that says, well done, congratulations, you've achieved something. Other people in the group, we know that if their friends are also doing it, there's something like a 27% more likelihood they will succeed. So it's, you're not on your own, make the group and make the decision small. Thanks. That works. Thank you. Can, Thank I, you. can I just add to that, which yeah. is Briefly. that idea, yeah. uh, that idea of making the right decisions the easy decisions was another theme that we saw both on a, on, a, on a school level. So, for example, some schools will say, um, oh, it's very difficult to give the children water because we're competing with monster uh, energy drinks. But actually, if you look at the schools where children eat well, the whole culture, the brand of good food is thought about by the teachers. The teachers eat with the children. The food tastes great. There just isn't that competing stuff there. To make the right decision is the easy decision. The work that Pekka Puska did in Finland, all sorts of little things like giving older people um, 
things to put on their shoes. They could walk outside, working with the sausage manufacturers to reduce salt. Um, lots and lots of little things so that you weren't requiring people to make huge changes to their lives. You were creating an environment in which small, small changes would be rewarded. Thank you. Can I just add just one Could we thing? just briefly, okay. because we need to get as many. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions for you, Henry. Thank you very much. Really interesting. My background is in public health nursing community, so very interested in that. Two things. One is um, a, a question about how your solution, which is really interesting, can, uh, could be rolled out for London. And the second question is about how to involve parents. Are the parents involved in what you were saying about um, the making a difference in terms of the food that's cooked and so on, because you've got this sense that the children could learn a lot at school, but life is very different when they get home. So I'll take the second question first. So uh, there are lots of schools that do an amazing job on involving the parents. At Car Sholton, uh, down in Sutton, uh, which is an incredible school that's been completely turned around, and part of that was changing the food. But they have things like lads and dads cooking clubs. So the dad comes to pick up his son, and they stay on for an hour after school and cook together. There are schools, we went to school in Leeds that did a similar thing where they invited uh, all of the fathers in to cook dinner for the pupils and the mothers. It was a predominantly um, Asian uh, intake, so this was viewed as being a kind of countercultural fun thing, a way of talking about healthy food, etc. So there are definitely ways in which good schools involve parents. Uh, on the flagship boroughs, could we roll them out to London? Uh, we're about to start it. Uh, we're very excited. that we're, we're, we're bringing experts in from around the world. We're going to create these very, very kind of energetic two <laughs> boroughs. Um, we hope that people will be coming to beg us. We hope they'll work and people will come and say, we need some of this in, in our area. But we're going, to fo we're going to focus on really showing that you can create big changes in outcome in a very small area initially. Um, but we'd love other people to come and, and take that on and see what works well and, and roll it out more broadly. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so, Henry, th first of all, thank you for your work. Um, and, and, Gore, thank you both for your work, because it helps all of us, actually, um, and it, it scales things up. Now, you've talked about schools, Henry. Um, I mean, in terms of how we could help these kind of things to become the norm in across London, do you have actually any policy recommendations for us at a city level? Um, and, you know, we often get asked about stuff like licensing. You've mentioned all the very adverse balances working against kids. And now 37% yeah. of them are, are overweight, actually, when they're 11. Yeah. It's, and it's, you know, I, I'm a father of, um, of a six-year-old and a three-year-old and an 18-month-year-old. It's incredibly hard to yeah. get young children to become mm -hmm. fat. I mean, you really have to to work at it, and 10% of people arriving at primary school. I mean, it's just it's yeah. terrifying. So um, it's not my area of expertise, first of all. We've looked very carefully at schools. But one thing that we did find in schools was where the schools that had made the changes, had, 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 where they had made changes that hadn't come about by government decree. You know, Bill Gates doesn't say to Microsoft, this year we're going to make £20 billion pounds or whatever it is, hundred billion dollars and therefore they make it. Um, they were all, all of those changes were made by the leaders in those schools, by enlightened head teachers uh, changing things in their school. And as, so most of the recommendations are planned, okay, how do we help those head teachers make that change? Um, uh, so, you know, if you think about that more broadly, I know that Rosie Boycott's looking, for example, at uh, work on the high street on fast food restaurants and toolkits for those. Um, I, I'm sure there's stuff from our, you know, in any given situation from what we've done. You know, I'm constantly asked if we'd ever get involved in hostel food. <laughs> you know, school food's taken over unpaid over a year of our life, half our time for a year of our life. So I don't, I think there are things in terms of it's not about decree. You can't legislate. It's too complex a world, health and food, to legislate to make things good. But I do think you can, you need to think about what creates the culture in those organisations and how do you both lead with carrot and stick the culture and also make it easy for the leaders in those areas to make changes. So that's not a very helpful answer that's to your question. Thank but you. I don't know. But I, think you. Uh, I think your question, though, was one where um, you're talking about how do you make legislation, how do you actually uh, do things at a borough or a city level. 
I think in the second decade of the 21st century, what we've got to realize is that there is an incredible communication network that spans all age groups now from almost the age that they can first interact with an iPad. And consequently, if we're going to be forward thinking and want to get to the people who really matter, which is the kids, you've got to reach them through their medium. And again, that's what our study was saying, that everybody from um, uh, elderly people down to kids, young kids, discount. They actually look at messages they receive and look behind that as if to say, I don't have to like maybe back in the 60s or 70s, if somebody said to my mum in Wales, um, if uh, she heard something on the TV or heard something written in a speech somewhere, it would be absolutely gospel, and that would be the way it goes. But nowadays in the second, second, century of the 20, uh, second decade of the 21st century, we all look at that, and we look at, the, we look at the rationale and the motivations behind that. And consequently, that's the struggle that um, the... the big institutions have to get their messages across and you've got to look at how these people receive their messages social messaging um, peer groups and to get momentum you have to secure their support great thank you, thank you. Tim so I'm just observing the both, both things that you uh, have talked about essentially about having fun yes uh, and allowing people to have fun and associating yeah. being yeah. healthy with a fun thing rather than uh, a, a doer thing yeah. and I, I wonder if that's something consciousness in your messaging and something that you feel we should reflect in that, that health isn't about being miserable yeah. is there's two elements in that and I agree completely with you uh, Tim the, uh, what we're seeing is we're seeing on an individual level that if you have other people in your group also having fun trying to count their steps trying to make little achievements and you can have it just one-on-ones, so or you can have it in small groups of four or five. That works incredibly. But what we've also seen recently is the corporates, everybody from people like Time Warner to uh, uh, Kimberly Clark, they're getting within their own employees this sense of corporate wellness. And again, working around the same sort of basis, so that if you have it in the workplace, similar sort of attention to... Um, being uh, taking more exercise, not making incredible changes, but just being literally park the car a certain distance further away from the supermarket instead of trying to everybody park at the main door. I mean, little tiny things like that. Then that gamification comes in, and people can then begin to see uh, a bit of motivation coming from just competing one on one with your friends. Can I be very yeah. quick on that? So I think it's absolutely the heart of it. We live in a society where um, if you read the papers, you're doing one of two things. You're either enjoying yourself and you're feeling a bit guilty because you're flying on a foreign holiday or drinking a bit too much or spending a bit too much, or you're doing good things and you're sacrificing something. You're eating mung beans or having a horrible salad or going to the gym or running in the rain and removing that paradox and saying, look, it is possible to be at the same time have things that are both good and fun and attractive is the key to unlocking people's minds. And I think if you look at the school food thing, a, a part of that culture that had come about was we'd had this very strange culture where schools were feeding children. It was like there, there was a service that was required to feed children as if that was some kind of, in itself, the end. And we tried to flip it around. It's actually about children eating and wanting to eat. It's not about feeling to... Um, feeding children. So it's about looking into the mind. The, you've got to put the child in this context first. And the first question you have to ask yourself is, what do they want? What's important to them? How can we make it both fun and good for them? And then everything flows out of that. But if you have a, very often the kind of approach is, what do we do to these children to make their lives better? And if you start with that point of view, I think you've already lost, lost the battle. Great. Uh, I think we have, I don't realise, we, we have five more minutes, so I'll... Uh, I'll ask you a few questions then. Uh, I think we're looking for, back to Yvonne's question, for sets of policy. Policy doesn't mean top-down. Uh, policy means that London will decide that is the policy. So on the school side, I mean, I think what we've heard today is mostly about behavioral economics, what you can do to change people's behavior, which is absolutely fine, and I agree with, and I think that is will become the norm. But 
from a sort of regulation or taxation. I mean, the one that really has worked is smoking. And, uh, and because the more we taxed it and the more... So no one has touched on about the, what's happening in other parts of the world. You know, should we ban trans fats? Any views on that? Uh, should we rate schools based on the health of their food rather than just their... So ratings of uh, A-levels and things like that? I've I mean, got a couple of policy On, on schools, I mean, we, we made 16 recommendations. 16, there were 16 actions, yeah. all of which are happening, and one recommendation, which was universal free school meals, which post-publication is now happening. So we kind of yep. used up some, most of our policy ideas in, in that. But I think there are a couple of, a couple of things. One is, um, I think the mayor the has been very good and has... Absolutely. It, it, with the flagship boroughs, but I think he should keep a close eye and support those and make sure those become part of, um, strong part of London's health culture. And if we can bring in other organisations um, so we can make that even more intense. So at the moment, we're just beginning to talk to the local health and wellbeing boards, those kind of things. Mm. But if you can help us create an even more powerful group than London to energise those boroughs even more, that would be helpful. That would be incredibly helpful. What? Drop us. A drop your, we'll Part of the we'll evidence would really want to yeah, develop these networks. Well. And trans fats, um, I mean, we, we are there's Salt. a uh, there's a new set of uh, sugar standards, new set of standards for for schools, yep. um, which are besides schools, but besides I, schools, I, but outside. Yeah. So trans fats, I mean, there are so many poisonous things in our in our diets. Trans fats are actually seem to be on the way out compared with ten years ago. I mean, as someone who who buys from suppliers quite a lot. We very, very rarely get now. We see catalogues where they've got trans fats in them. So they seem to be edging themselves out. Salt, sugar? I'm just... Uh, What's your thoughts? I haven't you? seen... So I haven't... I think that the problem with... The problem, so ta a sugar tax. The problem with a sugar tax is it is so unwieldy. You'd have discussion about how do you define sugar. Is concentrated apple juice sugar? Mm. Um, when, you know... Uh, there are, you know, there is a, a role in a child's life. I made my children um, uh, banana custard for uh, pudding last night on a Sunday night as a treat. Is that something that I'm going to be able to do because I have a bigger salary, but other people can't do it for their children? So I, my instinctive reaction to those kinds of bans is, A, they're complicated, and um, B, they can hit the wrong people. With, with cigarettes, you had such an identifiable... Yeah discreet thing uh, I think it was possible okay. but I, okay. I used to work for 10 years for Coca-Cola right which you know and so you transformed exactly and you look at this situation now where um, the awareness of sugar in people's um, diet is getting extremely high but again you still have the same situation as people discounting that information they almost screen it out in, uh, because they look at it and saying is something I don't want, really want to listen to. I understand the message getting across. With cigarettes, it became punitive because it hit sure. the affordability element. Sure. Um, there's a number of different examples around the world when you look at international examples. Look what Denmark did when they tried to um, put uh, extra um, uh, penalties or taxes on products that they deemed were less healthy. They've reversed that now. Mm. Um, you look at... Uh, um, there's a variety of different examples out there, which I think for the first time, somebody, a board like this, if they were able to look at things that had worked elsewhere and... We are, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Because up in Newcastle, for example, yeah. very recently yeah. in Newcastle, there was a whole, what they call, simulation study where um, senior members of the uh, health uh, institution mm. played a big role sure. where they looked at healthy life expectancy sure. between two boroughs. Sure. And literally, there was 10 miles apart and 10 years difference. Okay. So, how many people do you employ in the UK? In the UK, we employ very few people. We only employ about four or five people. Is that all? Essentially on sales and marketing, because we reach people through what we call our channel. Our channel are that we work with every single one of the major retailers, every single one of the major e-commerce companies. Do you mean your sales and marketing yes. is run through a third party? Fair exactly. Enough. Okay, but you touched on the corporate. I'd like to ask both yes. of you, corporate wellness which is something quite big in the U.S. because you have to remember yeah. companies pay the yeah. insurance of their employees, exactly. but their employees exactly. in this country are freely NHS. So what's your thoughts in, in incentives engaging more 
Let's start with the NHS employees. We employ how many people in London? NHS England? Uh, you know, how many? Well, thousands. thousands and so what do you suggest we should practice. do in the well-being of our own employees? Uh, in, in, uh, well, we do. I mean, we employ 300, 350 people, yeah. Leon. And um, we have, we think it's a big part of our culture to help our people get well. So we have, um, as well as... Uh, you know, obviously they're able to eat our food etc but we have training courses they can go on we teach them to cook we um, gym membership do you give uh, we that? do give them gym membership around certain gyms we do partners with gyms we do uh, we do life coaching with them because often it's uh, often it's you know some of the health issues are actually just other issues in their life so we try that, that are coming out and being expressed through food um, but we try uh, we think that from a very selfish point of view, we, we, we're simultaneously very. If you looked at what we do at Leon, we're kind of very left field. You know, we'll take people out, we'll give them acupuncture, uh, we'll uh, give them massage, we'll give them life coaching. But there's a very, very selfish uh, point of view behind it, which we tell them as well, which is if they're well and fit, then they will be more productive and they will make. Leon's stronger and Absolutely. better. And so I think that any organisation that ignores that side of it, but you have to do it in a way that... The problem is, again, you have to do it in a way that's not... It could be done very badly. Yeah. If you have a kind of... A cooker cutter, if someone says, oh, I've got to do employment, employee yeah. health and well-being yeah, yeah. on my list, or I've ticked that off on the tick box. So I, I would urge any organisation to do it, but you have it's to do the culture it in a way that engages the culture. I think from the experience I've yeah. got with um, working with my colleagues in the US and just literally... It, before I came in here, I was talking to people in South Africa about corporate wellness. The, the situation in the U.S. is where they get a reduction on their insurance premiums if sure. they can introduce something. Yeah. That's powerful in that it gives the company a motivation to do something. If the actual end result is just a token yeah. and they can just write it off to tax, then yeah. it defeats the object. What we are finding is very simply that if you, uh, if you engage in a program where you encourage people to do more of what they do every day, yep. make the decision as small as possible, be it at a corporate or in a general environment, you have a better chance of success. The biggest schemes will fail. Great. Because it requires too much investment, Fantastic. too much. Fantastic, brother. I can't thank you enough for being here and sharing those thoughts with you. Uh, any other thoughts you may have, please write to us. I know Yvonne is leading this team. She'll be delighted to hear from you. Uh, certainly the corporate experience elsewhere and how do we align those here, the food uh, and not just schools, yeah. hospitals, we can go on. Yeah. So thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.